Good morning, aloha everyone. We're gonna give it just another minute or two before we get started, but I just wanted to welcome all of you. Uh, thank you for attending. It looks like we have a pretty big audience today, so uh, please just stand by. We'll get started in just about a minute or two. Okay, I think we're going to get started here. So just wanted to say again, good morning to everybody. Aloha. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Marcus Yano, Executive Director of Architecture and Cloud Services for CBTS Hawaiian Telecom, and I'd like to welcome you all to another Hawaiian Telecom University event. Before we get started, I just wanted to review a few housekeeping notes about today's event. Please feel free to submit a question anytime during our presentation. To submit a question, please click the Q&A panel and type your question into the box. We'll have a Q&A session after the presentation and do our best to address all of your questions at that time. We have a lot of good information to share today, so I hope you can stay until the end. We'll also have a special offer at the end of the session that you won't want to miss. CBTS is a leading technology provider that delivers networking, cybersecurity, cloud, infrastructure, communications, and consulting solutions to clients across North America. We launched CBTS here in Hawaii last January. The technical expertise of our CBTS Hawaii team, together with our local sales and support teams, as well as our advanced technology solutions is a powerful combination. When you add that with Hawaiian Telecom's next generation fiber network, it creates a unique set of solutions. We also live and work here in Hawaii, so we understand the unique challenges that businesses in Hawaii are faced with. Our mission is to help local businesses help implement innovative, transformative technologies that drive desired business outcomes. Along those lines, our topic for today's event is transforming to a digital workspace. Even before the events of 2020, it had been estimated that the use of digital workspaces would grow at an annual rate of 60% through 2023. Analysts were already optimistic about the rapid adoption of virtual desktop solutions. Then, as we all know, along came COVID-19 and the massive work from home experiment of 2020. The pandemic hasn't changed the advancement of the remote worker. It simply accelerated it in record time. Today, we will discuss how companies are incorporating digital workspace into their business and how it's making a positive impact to their work process. We'll talk about where it goes from here and whether it's the right direction for your business. Let me introduce our expert panelists. John Bush is a partner at OpStack. He's been productizing, packaging, and selling technology for over 25 years. Whether at global phone companies or technology startups, John has a proven track record of helping teams build for success. He has ex expertise in identifying and prioritizing critical issues while developing the right strategies and action plans to deliver success. Ken Henserling, is the Director of Portfolio Management for Cloud Services at CBTS Hawaiian Telecom. He's been actively involved in technology integration in the education, small business, enterprise, and carrier space for over 20 years. His experience includes operations, programming, training, sales, product development, and product management. I'd like to start us off today with a quick poll to help us better understand what working model you as a business are planning to deploy in 2021 and beyond. 
You should see a poll question on the screen that says for the remainder of 2021, what is the most likely working model you will deploy? Please uh, submit your response and we'll review that quickly. We'll give it about 30 seconds or so for everyone to reply. Looks like we're getting a good amount of, of answers here, responses. A few surprising, actually. <laughs> okay, we'll give it maybe just a few more seconds here. Looks like most of the attendees have, have responded. All right. Great. Thanks for that. So, you know, surprisingly or not surprisingly, a majority of the respondents um, answered B with hybrid remote and on site. And I think that, you know, we'll talk about that. And, and I think that's where it's going. What's interesting to me are, are, you know, the number of respondents that have said or responded all on site. Um, you know, that's that's kind of surprising that everybody is going back into the office with, you know, as much as we've gone through through all of 2020. And uh, we actually got one that responded all di already digitally native, which is, you know, whoever that is, if you want to send me a note in the, in, you know, the Q&A section, I'd love to kind of chat with you afterwards. And, you know, a, a small amount have gone all remote. Um, so, yeah, with that, you know, I'd like to turn that over to Ken Henserling to begin today's event. Ken? Thank you, Marcus. Appreciate it. Welcome, everyone. Um, here's our agenda for today's session. We're going to be talking about some of the research we found in remote working. We want to look at a definition of the modern workspace. We want to see how customers, partners, and employees are doing business in today's environment. We'll talk about the need for a secure hybrid remote workspace. And then finally, we'll talk about how you can help assess your workspace needs. Working remote is not new. Companies have already been allowing for some work, uh, remote work in the past. Here's some of the conclusions in thinking about remote work pre-COVID. The big takeaways here were 52% really enjoyed the flexible schedule, scheduling. And then a lot of people felt like they had fewer distractions when they were working from home. And then obviously, 25, yeah, there was lower employee turnover for a lot of companies that had remote workers. However, the big surprise, or not so much a surprise, was that 54% of the IT professionals were really worried about security with remote workers. The first time um, I was asked to give a talk, and that was, uh, by the way, thank you for having me today, was, to, uh, was many years ago. Um, and my sales and marketing mentor said to me, use a chart. You're a marketing guy, throw a chart up. It makes all the sense in the world. But with Ken and I started going through this and we started talking about this, um, what, what really jumped out at us is there's many different sources. There's many different opinions. But the one thing that's inevitable when we looked at it um, throughout the whole process is no matter what we thought about, um, the, the, the real message in, in the prior slides was is that no matter what source you choose, there can be no denying that remote and hybrid work has changed um, what we're doing. It's one of the hottest topics. You do a Google search on it, uh, you'll find it everywhere. And as Ken mentioned, IT in particular has had no real choice. And one of the sources that we found was a gentleman named um, um, uh, named uh, um, Nicholas Bloom out of Stanford University. And he really uh, coined a phrase that said, one of the great upsides of the pandemic is we've accelerated in 25 years, uh, the drift from working from home in one year. And you know, to put that into perspective, you know, there's lots of things that we will say that COVID-19 brought, but probably the biggest legacy will be remote work, or one of the biggest legacy. Clearly, there's far more. Um, but the, the the things to take away um, from what, what Ken was saying is that 74% of business will retain some version of a remote or hybrid work. Um, and even when those do go back, one of the things that uh, that's jumped out at us is that 27% said, I'm not going to be the same. I'm going to be wary of crowded elevators, of subways. Um, indoor restaurants and dining and ride sharing, um, public public corridors. And it's something that we have to keep in our mind. The other one that jumped out at me was that 8% of employees said, hey, I'd be open to a pay cut 
to work from home. Now, 92% of people said, don't touch my pay. So we got to take that with a bit of great assault. But the idea and what we're starting to see is when we're actually going off and, and um, applying for jobs or we're looking at postings, we're starting to see that work from home or remote work or hybrid work is a benefit that companies are now starting to offer. The other thing, uh, you know, if I can ask anyone um, through this whole thing today is be open-minded, be thoughtful about it. But, you know, we're, we're up from the single digits in, you know, 2017, 2016, you know, close to 62% of Americans that, that worked last year worked in some capacity from a remote location. The other trigger that came out of this was there's a belief that they're saving on a, on a, on a, in a monthly basis, things like a commute so that you, you're not, it's H1, right? So you're not sitting on the H1 for 40, 40 minutes. Um, you're, you know, the traveling or the parking or even the takeout food, the local, local restaurant. Now the, the, the downside of that is that local restaurant near the business centers um, or the office buildings aren't seeing the benefits of what they used to see. So we've got, to, we've got to take that with a grain of salt. But the biggest one to me that jumped out was that, that U.S. patent applications that advanced these type of remote or hybrid technologies more than doubled between January and September of 2020. So that leaves me to think, even with some of the roughness that we've come across, it's only going to get better. But the downside of everything is culture. And, and, and I know there's this belief, um, you know, there's a bit of a, you know, we've got Gen Ys, Gen Xs, um, Gen Zs and baby boomers or whatever you want to mix into it. But COVID-19, when, when we looked at it is, you know, a year later, 54% are feeling overworked and 39% those that are fortunate enough to work are saying that they feel exhausted. And one of the things that we had to bind us in a previous, you know, in our previous world was we had a corporate culture. And what, what, what we're hearing is it's becoming more and more difficult to create and maintain that culture. And one of my peers said this to me the other day, and I thought it was, well, that was actually a pretty cool comment, is we're relying on earned reputation and relationship credits with our, our, with our employees. Now, there's always a balance to things. But what the other thing that we've seen is the time spent in meetings has more than doubled what we saw early last year. Um, time people spend actively sitting on, you know, their mobile phones, communicating on Slack or Messenger or Keybase or whatever you use is way up. And the big thing that we're seeing as well is that, um, you know, we really need to figure out how to be online and offline. And that distraction, I think we really need to, we, we really need to take into consideration on where we're moving forward. But one thing, one thing for clear is we're not going to return to the way we were. You're right about that, John. Uh, what we've discovered is that some people really have adapted to working from home. The CEO of Rite Aid has uh, felt like his company completely adapted to it and they've restructured their business around it. At the same time, people like the CEO of Netflix really hates it. Regardless, as you said, however we feel about it, it's clear that we're not going to return uh, to the way we were. And I think this statement by Tim Cook is really uh, the Apple CEO is really a, a good one. It says the success of remote working during the pandemic means that we won't return to the way we were. We will still want to get, we still want to get together physically. Employees can't run into each other in the quarter, for example, which really hampers creativity. But the benefit of the flexibility is part of us now. And we found that there are some things that actually work really well virtually. You know, in 2009, IBM reported that 40% of their works force was working across 173 countries were working remote. And they had uh, more than 58 million square feet of office space that they were able to unload, and it saved them nearly $2 billion. Their employees all had laptops, they had VPN connectivity, and access to their files remotely. But in 2017, IBM recalled 20% of its workforce in office, into offices. And why? It's because they came to the conclusion that it really, the proximity helps boost productivity. So I think that both uh, Tim Cook and IBM have come to realize that you need to have some sort of proximity to have that collaboration. So we're wondering if video, collaboration and hybrid work will be that proximity boost that everyone is going to be looking for.
consistent with what we have seen, there are some business segments that did very well in the pandemic. Uh, for example, financial services, management and professional services, technology and uh, digital type native companies and education all went pretty well into a COVID work from home type solution. But that didn't work for everyone. And in fact, certain organizations didn't uh, do quite well. They had to have plenty of people that still worked from home. So they were not able to have as many people go home. But what is really interesting, it's not so much about the industry that they're in, it's more about the task that they do. So you really have to take a look at the activities workers do within each segment and then determine whether that can be done in person or if it can be done remotely. But there are certain things like healthcare uh, in nursing homes and hospitals, uh, the people that check you out in the grocery store, people that are unloading goods on the docks and uh, sending things out to us on trucks. Those things have to be done in person. So really the takeaway is you have to take a look at the different roles within each yeah. industry to determine which type of task can be done remotely. So that, that, that's a great point, Ken. Sort of what you're saying is, is that you look at something like agriculture and it's got 40% that, you know, because they can work from home. But what they're really doing is, you know, they need to be out. They need to be, you know, you know manually uh, touching things. But the office workers might be able to work remotely. So let's not just say by default the industry can't. It's the role within the industry. and But some by nature are just more, you know, presumed to be uh, a target industry. Great, great, great. Absolutely. Well, let's take a look at how we would define modern workspace. Deloitte defines it as a digital workspace comprised of all the technologies people use, both those that they know about and those that they don't know about yet. And when we take a look at what uh, Gartner says, they say that the digital workplace facilitates new and effective ways of increasing employee engagements. But here's the way I sort of look at it. Um, the modern work, the modern online workspace brings together everything, the people, data, applications, and more that teams need to get things done. One thing that's constant is change. Our work environments have changed. We're still trying to work out how to manage our office spaces. Our business plans are changing as we shift to see what's going to help us stabilize and grow our businesses in 2021. It's safe to say if your company is still doing business today, your business plan has changed and adapted to where it was, I mean, from where it was pre-COVID. And finally, uh, when we allow employees, we're allowing employees to work from is also changing as we realize that there are benefits that can be gained from remote work. Speaking of change and adaptability, I, well, one of the things that um, we had the pleasure to work with, um, and this is a case study, a company called Image Options, um, based in, um, in, um, in in California, LA, and, 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 and San Francisco, um, predominantly. Um, and they, they literally, on March the 1st, 2020 of last year, they went, wow what just happened i mean these guys are the guys that were part of large format event graphics company they produced um you know when you you go to san francisco and you see dreamforce by salesforce and you see all the placards up and you see all the graphics on the buildings and you see the city become salesforce these are the guys that produced all of that they did a ton of work with ikea they did many many pieces of work with uh with walmart and their customers basically said on march the first while they had to shut down in california you know what are we going to do and and events were canceled. So literally the senior management team needed to regroup. Now, not everyone in the company, they went into a shutdown very quickly, but the senior management team, because they had the tools and the facilities, they were able to actually you know, use email and Slack and Zoom. They had internet native software, so they weren't stuck with legacy pieces that they couldn't get remotely. Um, but their data was in their on-premise servers. How were they gonna get to it if they weren't allowed to connect? Laptops with VPNs and application software allowed them to do their CAD and, 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 and serious work. But really, you know, they were sitting there saying, how do I regenerate my company? Well, one of the executives got a call and said, hey, you know, we need, we need PPE badly from a local hospital. 
because they were in the plastics business and they were in part of the, you know, the, the being able to, to, to formulate these things, they re-engineered and prototyped face shields and secured the first order for 100,000 units. Um, you know, not everyone could do that, but if I go back now, I come back a year later, um, essentially it produced 2 million face shields nationwide. All of their employees have been able to return back to work safely. Um, many of them are remote. With 40, they had to actually add 40 temporary employees into the plant to be able to actually um, handle the, the, the workload. Um, they pivoted. They actually set up an e-commerce site to accept new PPE orders seamlessly. So there was something that didn't exist prior. They transitioned to essential markets by creating transaction barriers. If you see in the picture, you can see you know the plastic screens that sit in front of the um, in the grocery store or the blue dots on that floor there is for safe distancing. They radically changed their business model. They want to still be in the event space, but they're just not able to yet. So they began consulting and advising retailers and corporations on how do you do space con um, configuration for the return to that workplace. So not ideal by any stretch, but because they were able and capable of working remotely and being able to take much of what they needed in the office to their houses, they were able to actually continue and in many ways thrive. So one of the things you know I liked about the, the, the poll that we asked initially with Marcus was, is we're now you know 16 months in, and you know we we've, we've started to really get a flavor for this. You know the enthusiasm over some of the things that we we thought initially was great. You know maybe it's not as super as it was, but let's take a look and say, now that we're 16 months in, what do we want to do for the next 16 months, and how do we want to really address the needs that this this uh, pandemic has created? And, you know, when we first started it, you know, hey, I would theme it, home ain't so bad. It means, you know, 62% of employees worked at home during the crisis compared to 2000, you know, 2018. Um, how many of you heard cats um, in the background? Um, you might hear mine in a couple minutes, so who knows, it's dinner time for me right now. Um, but 80% report that they actually enjoy working from home. 41% said that they're more productive than they've ever been before, and 20% they are as, as productive. So close to 70% said, this is pretty good. Fast forward, 20, 2021. And things have sort of changed. Uh, we see a lot of businesses are opening back up, but they're in a hybrid mode. Some people work from home, some people come into the office or combination. There's been a large increase in the share of office jobs ads that are now allowing remote work. And we also see a growing willingness of employees or employers to hire workers outside of the normal office commute areas. Um, certainly that's the situation here at CBTS Hawaiian Telecom. Uh, we have remote workers both here and on the mainland as well. Uh, and also we're definitely seeing a trend uh, of folks moving to more desirable locations when they can choose to. to. We can all see uh, how the pandemic is affecting various things here. Uh, but one of the things that I don't miss at all is the commute. Uh, in fact, uh, that's a nice uh, thing that we have to uh, enjoy while we can, uh, but pretty soon we'll have to go back to the office, some of us. But one of the things that we've discovered is one out of two people, if they could uh, live where they wanted to, would be really open to relocation. And that allows uh, for you to consider having workers that may not necessarily be on the same location or same island. I know that we certainly now have people that live on Maui and their primary job is here on Oahu. And we also have people living in various places across the mainland as well. So if you really take a look at, uh, this is a typical office space that you would see in high tech firms across the nation. Well, this environment, as we can see, really doesn't work anymore and will definitely have to be adapted to new and changing social distancing rules. I have two sons, uh, one at Google and the other at Zoom, and they've been both working remotely, bouncing between Hawaii and California since their company sent employees home. Most companies, I believe, are in the process of figuring out what their offices were going to look like going forward. And I think we've successfully demonstrated that employees can live and work remotely. So how is this going to change the shape of the modern workspace? Let's take a look at how important, uh, at what is important for businesses to consider 
as they plan on how today's work environments continue to change. So it takes some planning. I think one of the things uh, that you'll have to do is really take some thoughtful uh, consideration. John likes to refer to it as thoughtful operations. Uh, I think the four boxes represent key areas that you'll need to consider carefully as you build out the modern workspace. You know, your company needs to be able to control and configure the workspace to fit their needs. You have to be able to collaborate wherever you are, in the office, out of the office, at home, or remote on the road. And also we have to take a look at what kind of desktop do workers need? What's that gonna look like? What kind of applications should they have available to them remotely? And finally, we have to really think of it in terms of workspace mobility. They need to be able to have the same working environment no matter where they are. John, I believe you're on mute. Ken, all excellent points, thanks. Um, and, and it's part, something that we've got to be um, confident on and, and think about as we, we get moving forward. And we're going to get into technology a little bit, but you know, what we really want to think about as much as it is the technology evolution, it's also, it's how do we re reconstruct how work is done? Things that we've in the past said, you know, this could only be done in the office. Well, is that right? And I think, you know, like we're going to, we're going to say some things have to, some things may not. Sometimes we can balance those facts. I mean, the other thing I think we want to take a look at is, is that, um, uh, you know, uh, do I need people in the offices to work or can I get the work to the people? And how do I reclassify those roles and task segments and consider the value of remote might, might bring? And one of the key things that we've, we've, we've been working with people on is, is it, you know, ask your employees because they're an important asset. Um, you know, and then once we've made that decision, then we start talking about designing the workspaces to accommodate the, the, the approach that we've chosen. You know, it's, it's, we're so quick to say, hey, I need a VPN or I need the server. Or I need, um, you know, this, this type of technology. Why don't we figure out what we're doing with it first before we're actually starting to do the deployment? And uh, I, had the, I had the pleasure, um, and again, in pre preparing for this, to, to join a, a session with the Financial Times. And they, 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 the session was a global architecture firm. And they, they brought it to the point that said, you know, the big change for us in the past 12 months was we're no longer designing our office floors or our, or our buildings for this 20 year cycle that we'd always done in the past. We're starting to think about it in a much more, you know, we always had that, we did you want to, you know, open workspace or do you want offices, but it's much more in a modular function. Because if, if what COVID has taught us more than anything is we got to reschedule. And I think there was a quote by the, your, the Bank of Hawaii, one of the, uh, one of the senior people that said, you know, we don't expect to actually to be laying more people off and we're expecting to bring people in, but we also expect that we're going to have to work with social distancing. And what does that mean from a space perspective? How do I reconfigure it? If you build your office space for a 20 year life cycle that can't be moved, can't be changed, you're going to have some challenges in the next little bit. So something again, beyond just technology, you want to think about the, the or, you know, where we sit with, um, with our physical assets. Um, the other thing is when Ken and I started going through this, um, you know, what do we want to talk about is we know that economics is a big dis discussion and it's, it's tricky because we're going to try not to get so much in, although we've referenced it and we'll you know, how much my employees are saving because they're working from home or how much am I saving because I can downsize my office space and repurpose it. Um, it's much more about what does a, what does a, sp a space look like? What does it cost me to put someone in that space? Um, and, and, and we describe it in sort of three ways. One, we're going to call them full Monty, and that's the loaded cost of a desk. And we know this, you know, from, from prior lives about, you know, um, you know, a big for a consulting firm, a bank, a compliance heavy organization. Um, then, you know, it was a pro government, some government agency it was about $2,500 per month when you took a look at internet, phone, desk, rent, janitorial, you know, in this case, literally probably the kitchen sink. But it does, you know, in, in our scenario, we're not including the data center because if we're going to compare things, you know, we're essentially moving certain ports of the data center out from where you were traditionally. So, you know, when you think about it, that's $2,500 a month. If I'm hoteling or I'm moving people back and forth, every seat that I save, I can start saving money. So when you think of an you know, employee with 2,000 or 3,000 or 5,000 or even 500, if you move 10 people out, that's a pretty impactful number by the end of the year. 
The second one we're, we, we call is something that's been more of the traditional approach for those that needed remote work. And that was really for people that were targeted roles and, and people that, um, you know, that we would have for some of the executive, the salespeople or, or uh, you know, very defined, um, you know, maybe programmers. And we would, we would, or people that needed access to their databases remotely. And it was providing, you know, proper high availability, you know, Cisco UCS, some next scalers and a Citrix VDI environment. And, you know, we did our economics and said, you know, that comes around $266 a month, you know, essentially, you know, say $160,000, $170,000 to buy all the, the, the assets, install them, get them configured for the CapEx. You know, you got 60 users, you know, you amortize it over 30 months. Um, then, you know, you essentially, if you're going to do it right, you double it because you've got your high availability and storage, gets you up into that 200 and, 200 and change range. Um, the third one that we've seen really dynamically change in the last 16 months is this thing that we're calling Workspace as a Service. And it's a new contender. It's secure, it's scalable, it's cloud workspaces with, you know, with, with averaging, you know, requirements is typically coming in around the $50 a month range. So, you know, it, it depends on what you're, you know, what you need and how you're going to utilize it and, and, and what you're accessing. But, you know, we've seen with some of the, our companies that are in financial services or, or in the, um, excuse me, in the, in the accounting or legal fields, um, it's, it's a, it's a, a relatively um, solid number to go with. Um, you know, so, so we really want to think about, you know, how do we, how do we take advantage of that type of an economic, um, you know, an economic situation? And, you know, to put it into real terms, um, we, uh, we worked with a firm um, and worked with a firm and, and, and essentially, um, you know, they were a, a, a accounting firm like none other. We didn't realize that, you know, how many connections and how cu customers they had, but it was actually a lot more than I thought initially. But essentially, they went from primarily being a face-to-face -face environment with some private cloud so that customers could remotely get to their data and upload it and remove it and things like that. Um, to becoming a full remote work environment. I mean, they had to go completely remote, and which meant that that 50% of their, their 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 customers that weren't online needed to be put online. Um, when you considered that they had a local MSP that was helping them provide the capacity in the data centers, they needed to upgrade their functionality because these guys weren't alone. They had other customers that needed it, and all of a sudden, you know, the the, you know, the MSP saying, "I need that extra hardware to be paid for." Well, the, the accounting firm saying, you know, I'm not, I'm going to have to pass this on to my clients. And so all of a sudden we're not getting the service we want. We're having to pay more for it. And quite frankly, um, there wasn't a good taste in, in our, the, our client's mouth. So we sat down and, you know, immediately said, you got to get us off. You got to move us. You gotta, and, and, and we said, yes, absolutely. But one of the most important things, and we were fairly certain what the solution was, is you need to begin with what we call as a rapid remote assessment, access assessment. And because when you come up as, and you say, hey, it'll cost this much. One of the biggest things that, that I found in the technology field is people feel really bad or they think, oh, I can't trust this guy because, oh, he said it was going to be this, but it ends up being this. And maybe that was because we weren't thoughtful going in. Even though we knew what it was, there may or may not be things in the environment. So when we do a rapid assessment, you can you know, start to identify key components of how the solution is going to work. And, you know, that way it also allows us to actually securely move um, to, to whatever the, the instance of the cloud that they need to go to. Uh, this one in particular was based on Microsoft Azure. And we add, we're able to add incremental file share and secure storage. And even, you know, in, in process of discussion is the idea to have always on remote backup um, procedures for we can hot swap to another region if that data center goes down. The most important thing to the client was they didn't need to spend that extra money on hardware and infrastructure. Um, they were able to direct their dollars to something that was, you know, much more, much more um, targeted. And the estimate is they're going to, you know, even after all that, you know, the, the, the assessment and the targeted installation, they're going to save close to 50% um, over, over the first year, right? So there's some real serious economics involved in doing it if you do it well. The other thing that we've learned from some of our customers without doing it or just getting to the cloud and, and rushing it, and this is why I would ask some of the people listening today, is to go back and take a look at what you did do because we also found that it's easy to spend too much money in the cloud, so you got to kind of balance it. As we've been looking at what kind of tools are needed to enable hybrid workspace, uh, we've been doing a lot of these things. Uh, we provided these services more or less on a standalone basis. But now with Workspace as a Service, we're really looking at 
putting together all the things that need to be combined in part of a hybrid workspace. And so you can see here things that are very important. You need a scalable modern infrastructure. Security is extremely important. It needs to be patched on a regular basis. You need the storage capacity that John mentioned. It's also got to be fairly flexible and designed for the tasks, specific <coughs> needs that are there, collaborative, innovative desktops and software tailored to the user's actual job tasks. And then, of course, we've seen how important now it is to have communication capabilities, whether it's voice and video, mail and uh, messaging, as well as conferencing. These are all part of what is needed for a hybrid workspace. One of the companies we've been really working with is Microsoft. As you can see, they've had a very successful collaboration tool with Microsoft Teams. Uh, they have grown, they've added 95 million users in 2020. It's one of the fastest growing apps in the <laughs> pandemic. And they currently have over 145 million daily active users on Microsoft Teams. Uh, this growth has been phenomenal. And they really have a, a lot of organizations, over 500,000 organizations that are using Microsoft Teams as their default messaging platform. And it's made them a lot of money. And it's, uh, we're also taking a look uh, at what Google, AWS, and Zoom are doing as well because they've experienced the same kind of online growth. But we've really started focusing in on a solution built around Microsoft uh, and their cloud services for our workspace as a solution. It really starts with the cloud. In our case, Workspace as a Service is built in Microsoft's public cloud and is built around the new Microsoft Windows Virtual Desktop Service in Azure. As you can see, it brings together a variety of services that you would need all in that protected environment. In particular, uh, they've added a variety of services that add new functionality and security in this kind of arrangement. In particular, Windows 10 multi-sharing and new line of business application stacks are part of the service. There's a new RDP, remote desktop protocol, that initiates the session out back to the customer as, as opposed to just connecting. You need to be sure you who you are, that you are who you say you are, so they really enhance security. If you look at all these building blocks that are provided in the Azure Public Cloud, you can see the various components we've been putting together. And we've extended Microsoft's Windows Virtual Desktop by adding optimization and additional management tools that are not required. Uh, and you can see here from that cloud environment, we provide secure connectivity back to your various locations, as well as providing secure connections to your remote users. Your company's security policies are applied and enforced based on best practices as to help you meet the corporate specific needs that you already have. There's single sign-on, uh, the data is encrypted, uh, it uses multi-factor authentication, and it's provided uh, an environment that can be locked down and non-persistent by default to help meet the strictest compliant uh, requirements. And you can use whatever device is available for you, Windows, Mac OS, Chromebooks, iOS, and Android. Our solution supports all of these devices plus any HTML5 browser. Your desktop, your applications, and files are all available regardless of where you go. So from the Azure Cloud environment, we provide secure connectivity. You can see that these are some of the elements that make up our workspace as a service. A modern infrastructure, you can connect from anywhere, best-in-class security. It's always upgraded and patched, so you don't have to worry about that. Applications are added dynamically. There's no need to build a golden image each time you have an application added or changed. And you can start local and scale global. Oh, John, you're on mute again. So the question I'm asked is, is how do we start? Um, what are our steps to success? And, and, and we, we, we do run with the phrase, you know, it's thoughtful operations. But it really starts with beginning to know what you got and plan on what you need. Establish your internal objectives. I mean, we spend a lot of money on technology. We spend a lot of money on our people. 
take half a day, take some time and really truly think about what your objectives and goals are. I know it's hard. We're always running fast, but be thoughtful about it. And because, you know, we're going to be the first guys to say, you not all companies can or want to be completely cloud native. It doesn't make sense for some. Um, they do need to have access to internal corporate resources remotely. So even in those scenarios, you got to think about it. You know, with the right architecture, um, the cloud can be secure as the best corporate infrastructure. And in fact, maybe more secure. And, you know, 100% of the Fortune 500 companies are exploiting it. You know, you've got your JP Morgan Chases, your Afflex, your General Motors, your Siemens are all going to the cloud. You know, you know the, the other really big benefit of this, the, this new model is you no longer have to buy that capacity that you need up front. You're not building, you know, buying the infrastructure to your peak load. You know, the move from CapEx to OpEx means that your desktop technology spend can both grow and shrink according to your needs. And we can get into that a little bit more if, if you like, but it really starts with secure and utilize those best practices. Simplify, standardize, automate, orchestrate, and monitor for success. You know, use multi-layer protection and state-of-the-art encryption that's built in to ensure that your corporate IP stays within the organization. In one of our customers that we can actually shut down the functionality so you can't copy something from local, you can't access a local um, computer if you're in the remote and your hybrid space, or if you are actually at the desktop in the office, you can. So there's lots of interesting things that we can do with it. But the most important thing to drive home is leverage your cloud partner to patch, monitor, update those system routines and routinely and around the clock. I mean, let's not have you getting up or your 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 you know or one of your employees get up at three o'clock in the morning because there needs to be a patch or some we need some uptime. So it really starts with about knowing what you got and planning what you need. We've been working with um with uh, CBTS uh, Hawaii uh, to come up with something we call as a workspace as a service remote rapid assessment. You know, it evaluates your current. Um, remote and hybrid needs. It's, it follows the methodology. It lets you to kind of walk through a checklist with us and say, you know, how do I, how do I, you know, I, I had to accelerate to get here. Maybe it's time one size didn't fit all. And I can really sit back and look at it. And if you're not doing it today, you got to look at, evaluate the performance of your environment. You know, after COVID, the, I mean, the headline for 2020 was ransom attacks, you know, which were up 150% over the prior year. The guys, the bad guys are still out there. And so the more thoughtful we can be about what we're designing and what we're implementing, the more powerful it can be for you. So design and implement that secure solution that can scale to suit your needs. In summary, here's what we want to leave you with today. A modern workspace solution is really mandatory moving forward. You need to use technology to help you thrive and succeed. But you have to be thoughtful about your choices. You want to start with secure, and it's really important to choose the right partner now more than ever before. We want you to know you're never alone, and we will help you on this journey. We made it, Ken. Great. Thanks, thanks, Ken. Yeah. So, you know, I think we're going to move into our question and answer uh, session shortly, but I just wanted to bring up to you um, the our offer. Um, you know, that we have going on here for uh, sign up for our free readiness assessment. Uh, where we'll offer to meet up with our cloud solutions engineers or architects, uh, where we'll evaluate your current work environment, identify what's needed, and then help to tailor a plan to fit your business. As John mentioned, one size does not fit all. Uh, and what we've learned over time is that really tailoring that to your specific business needs and your environment and just how you're working uh, defines how quickly you can find success or whether or not you find success at all. As part of our exclusive offer today, you know, we are also uh, offering to anybody that signs up for our service a three month uh, credit uh, towards that service. So you should see a pop up on the lower portion of your window here where it talks about uh, getting a free workspace as a service readiness assessment. If you click on that, it'll take you to our area where you can sign up now. If you happen to have clicked on the X and closed it out, you'll also see it up on the top right hand side of your view where it says a current offer and you can go ahead and sign up there. So uh, with that, I'd like to go into our Q&A session here. Uh, you know, we got two questions that I saw uh, that popped up and the first one that I think are, are 
you know, very pertinent both around security and, you know, this is a common topic that we run into, uh, but maybe, um, you know, we'll read out that question. It says, how are companies protecting their proprietary information and technology when using cloud services via companies like Microsoft that may or may not have backdoor access to this information? I don't know if, um, you know, maybe Ken or, or John, if you, John, maybe you want to take that? I think, sure. Go ahead, you go, John. Ken, and I'll, I'll support you as you go. Go ahead. All right. I think one of the most, uh, the first things that we think about is that the uh, data is encrypted uh, pretty much the entire time. It's encrypted in transport, it's encrypted at rest when it's stored there. And so the data is secure in that kind of environment. And I think also what a lot of people don't realize is how much money Microsoft and the public cloud providers have invested in making sure their services are secure and that their infrastructure is secure and backed up. And really uh, security has become, and compliance has become one of the key hallmarks of those kind of services. John, anything you want to add? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of different things and, and, and I'm a teeny bit, um, I'm a teeny bit dangerous. So, you know, I would, I would bring in one of my experts on it, but uh, you know, there's a few things, um, you know, it, you, you can, Microsoft does allow you to bring your own key. So the, the cloud provider has no access to your data. And I think that, you know, the, the, the danger with something like that is if you lose your key, you lose your data, but you do that in your own world as well. Um, you can you can look at things like um, the, the, the enhanced um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, RDP protocol, whereas in the past where you set a session, you can go everywhere. What happens is you connect and then the, the unit reconnects back out to you to set the session outward. So there's some really, really interesting things. Of course, we'll talk about uh, multi-factor authentication can work within your environment. You can put group policies in place um, to actually make sure that, uh, you know, a rollback, um, role-based, you know, authentication. So only certain people can do certain things. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, but the probably the biggest one is, um, is it's always updated and patched at an OS level, as an infrastructure level. So you're no longer worried about what version am I, am I on. You're on the most recent recent um, 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 uh, version of, of, of the Azure of the Azure and the Microsoft software. Hey John, if I can if I can add on to that, I think that's that's a great point. I think what this question brings up is something I hear often in discussions with businesses around less around the the access to the the desktop, right? I think a lot of companies have now matured to a level where they have policies in place. They understand um, just how much of an audit trail exists within those environments that anybody that's logging in is, you know, their IP address is captured. The ID that was used to do that was captured, right? There's there's multiple things that are put in front with multi-factor authentication, uh, IP address validation, all of these different controls yeah. that could be put in from a systems access side. I think one of the things that I often hear still is the concern that the physical access to that data. What happens if it's stored on some storage array that I don't know who can plug into that and pull data off of that? Uh, what I'll tell you is that in many, many discussions with Microsoft as a partner um, and trying to get access to data centers, they control that to, to you know, a ridiculous level. Um, if you just think about the scale that Microsoft operates and the, the billions of dollars that they have invested in this infrastructure and this type of platform, um, to understand how much that matters to them. If, if anybody ever, you know, got a story broke out on the street that some, you know, technician or engineer happened to pull drives off of a storage array and was able to extrapolate that data and, and you know, move out from there, um, you know, that would basically tank a, you know, a hundred billion dollar industry uh, for someone like Microsoft, right? So just understand that that's where that's at. There's just as much controls from the software access side as there are physical access, right? We can't get into the data centers. Uh, you can't go down certain aisles, right? There's there's armed guards there um, for exfiltration of equipment. I mean, down to just, you know, how they destroy the drives whenever there's an issue, right? That, you know, if you think about it, if you're familiar with vendors that there's, you know, these advanced replacements of sending drives back out, they don't send drives out. Right, those drives stay there. It's part of their cost. They just basically destroy them, uh, and they go from there. So hopefully that you know kind of answers or lays some of those fears. But you know, as we go through those assessments, you know, what I would point out is that the security of the cloud is really an extension of of your corporate environment and your posture and your program that you have. 
And so, you know, we make sure that as we go through those assessments, that if there are things that are lacking, that we identify that and then use the cloud to kind of augment or maybe accelerate your adoption of those principles. Um, but, you know, they are, again, a, you know, a hundred billion dollar company that, that has to adhere to certain things. Uh, and so they are, you know, doing much more than most companies are, are doing in that space. Um, yeah. I think, you know, the, the second part or second question I see listed has a lot to do with that, again, around uh, with having so many people remote, right, logging in from home or whatever that environment is, their local Starbucks or, you know, Wi-Fi hotspot. Um, you know, how do we how do we address the secure VPN option with all the different you know vendors out there? And how does the modern workspace that we're talking about address VPN? or those concerns that VPN addresses? Well, I think there's a couple of ways to think about this. Right off the bat, identity management and uh, laptop or device management, mobile device management is a key part of any solution that you look at for remote work. So we talked a little bit about how Microsoft has changed the way they do the connectivity back to the remote uh, device. They now don't just leave it wide open. They actually reestablish a connection coming back in so that it's there. They have a variety of authentication uh, schemes that are in play. Uh, and this is all a very important part of protecting that. And then we also identified the fact that, let's say somebody was listening in at Starbucks and, and sniffing around. Your data is all encrypted, so they're not going to get open data. They're going to see an encryption screen that they can't get at. So there's a variety of things that are in place uh, to make that more of a secure transaction, even regardless of where they're at. Yeah, and, and just to drive it home, I mean, it's part of a well-architected framework that, that Microsoft and, and other cloud providers would, would, would propose. I mean, you know, the concept of is, is that you want encryption um, at, you know, at rest um, all the, and encryption in transit all the way through. So it's uh, you know it's the highest grade uh, uh, encryption out there without using a specific VPN in a very determined manner. Um, the uh, you know when, when you think about it, the, as I, I think Marcus so so eloquently put it on the first one, this thing has been built to be secure. You know, and it, and again, part of our, part of the effort is to think about what you're trying to implement, and and how does that run across your organization. So putting that good discipline in place is going to help this process and just make it better. Okay. The, the last thing I would say there is this is not really a new service. We've been working with Microsoft on uh, their with their Windows Virtual Desktop for over two years, and all and companies all over the world have been testing, evaluating, enhancing, and that's exactly why we looked at things that needed that we felt like needed some added additional pieces too. But this is more of a mature technology. This is yeah. where. Uh, virtual desktops and remote working is going, and it really truly is representation of a modern digital workspace. Yeah, in transit, and and, and Ken and Marcus, you can you can you know re reaffirm this is that the the the, the 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 encryption in transit is the same technology that protects B two B banking transactions. So you, you can feel comfortable from that perspective. Great guys, thanks. We got another question that, that asks, you know, are certain devices better suited for use with workspace as a service? So that's a, that's a good question. I know everybody sort of has their own favorite device. And I would say that for all of the major operating system and desktop or mobile devices that are out there, they're all supported with native clients that work uh, directly in their native language, be that Mac OS, Windows, be that Android or iOS, uh, and even, even in Linux, although that's not as recommended, in Chromebooks, they all have native apps that work and allow you to do that. So I think it just depends on the user's preference. Uh, some people are gonna be really comfortable with Macs, and that's certainly gonna work. It works on an iPad, it works on an iPhone. Now, personally, I don't wanna do my desktop on a phone, but it does work. Uh, so it just really depends on your personal preference. And we think that is another, thing that gives you a certain amount of flexibility. Even if that work station that you access it with changes, the desktop environment will be the same regardless of the device. So it really gives you freedom to choose maybe a lower cost uh, mobile device to access it from. It also gives you the freedom to move around and use different devices and you're still in a totally secure uh, virtual workspace. 
Can, can I try something really quickly? This could be dangerous, but um, this will give you an example. I'm sitting here right now on a Mac. Can you see my screen? Mm, um, nope. Oh, you can't see? It didn't, nope. didn't come up. I was going to say, I've got the remote desktop running in the background. Oh, um, it's, it's up there it's up now. Down, John. Right. So yeah. I've got it running in the background. So you saw my Mac workspace, which is a very messy desktop. But sitting right here, I just switched over and I'm in a workspace as a service, um, which you can see is clearly a Windows environment. So, I mean, it's been, it's been designed to be flexible across major platforms. And whether you're, you're actually coming in from a client, you're coming in from um, uh, an HTML5 basis, you know, it's been designed to be actually um, very fluid. Okay? All right. Yeah, excellent. Hey, I think we got uh, one last question because we're running out of time here. But, uh, you know, what type of business or organization can best benefit from your workspace solution? I don't mind taking a crack at that one. I think I think there's definitely um, uh, there's native um, uh, industries that make a lot of sense, and and we we talk about it. What we were saying is whether it was the financial services, it was legal, it was accounting, um, it was um, marketing, it was advertising, areas that use a lot of digital um, native environments, and I think that's an important one. Um, that they that or information workers or skilled skilled workers from that perspective that need remote access and they can be functional with remote access to things. But I think we want to be very cautious. What Ken, what we were talking about when Ken was highlighting is you can't just generically say one industry because um, you might have a role within an industry that typically isn't um, you know maybe it's a lumber industry that isn't necessarily or fishing that you say hey that's not one where I'm going to do remote work because I got to physically catch the fish or cut the tree down. But there might be people in the in the office or in the remote location that need access to files that sit somewhere else. That that remote scenario could work. That hybrid scenario. So when I'm not out in the field that day, I'm actually in the office and I need access to my information. So you know what I would suggest is give us a call anyways and let us talk about it. And if it works for you, it's great. If it doesn't, then uh, completely understood. Excellent. Thanks, John, for that. Uh, I'd like to just wrap up and, and say, hey, lots of great information covered today. Uh, thank you very much to both Ken and John for your insight and, and covering you know, in, in depth some of the use cases and case studies of, of success that we've seen firsthand, right, of our customers and how we've helped them transition and transform uh, and just how much it's accelerated their opportunity to kind of adjust uh, course over the last year that's been very challenging for many businesses, if not all businesses. Uh, I'd like to say that, you know, please take advantage of our exclusive offer from attending the event today. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, if you had closed out the offer on the lower portion of your screen, you can still find that up on the right hand side uh, that you should see something that says offer up there uh, for our free readiness assessment. Um, you'll also notice in that top right hand side that there is a handout section. If you click on that, you can see a nice little infographic that Ken talked to earlier where it talks about the cloud and what's uh, provided in there and maybe the extensions of that workspace into your domain and area, as well as some additional information around the workspace solution sets and how we approached what we approached. Um, lastly, I'd like to say, please take our survey. When you exit our event today, you'll be automatically redirected to a survey about today's event. Uh, we you know, value your time and, and appreciate it. We understand that it is something that is very uh, valuable and, exp you know, in limited amount. And, you know, we, we want to make sure that these events are insightful, uh, that they're a good use of your time, that, that, you know, it's worth your efforts. And so we do take to heart and incorporate your feedback in our future events. Um, with that, you know, I'd like to thank you all again for attending and look forward to seeing you at our next event. Take care. Aloha. Thank you. Oh.